when the great British economist Edwin Cannon was asked in the, in the early 1920s what he had done in the war, he replied simply, I protested. Uh, and, and one of the things that he protested most vigorously uh, was the myth uh, that's even common today among both economists and non-economists uh, that war cannot be financed by other than monetary inflation. That is, that there are problems, inherent problems, with trying to finance a war via taxation and non-inflationary borrowing. Um, in fact, as uh, Ludwig von Mises has written, um, and I quote, one can say without exaggeration that inflation is an indispensable means of militarism. Without it, the repercussions of war on welfare become obvious uh, much more quickly and penetratingly. Uh, war weariness set, would set in much earlier. But ca Cannon's and Mises' positions, though they're superficially at odds, really reinforce one another. Um, what Cannon is arguing is that, in fact, war production can certainly and straightforwardly be financed by taxation and by government borrowing from the public. Um, what Mises is saying uh, is that inflation is almost always used, however, though he agrees with Cannon's position, um, as deliberate policy for distorting monetary um, calculation uh, and obscuring the true costs of war, okay, hiding the costs of war from the public. Um, one of the few great wars, or the only great war, that was uh, financed by non-inflationary means was um, uh, Napoleon's adventures. Okay? He seemed to have maintained a, a gold standard. But for the rest, they are generally financed by monetary inflation. So in my paper, what I'll do is um, to briefly discuss the, 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 the canon Mises view of uh, how war can be financed by taxation okay, and what it means as far as um, the public finding out very quickly about the true costs of war. Then I'll show how what process occurs when, when the state uses the increase in the money supply to finance the war. Okay? How, in fact, it can postpone, um, or not, not, not so, much po so much postpone, the cost is real, okay, as I'll show you, but obscure uh, the cost of war to the public. I'll then, uh, if I have time, touch briefly upon two alternative views that claim that war um, must, uh, is inherently inflationary. That is, that uh, it must be financed by monetary inflation. And then uh, I'll conclude with um, an illustration of the Mises Cannon view that, in fact, inflation is a deliberate choice. And I'll do that with reference to the Vietnam War. Okay? A deliberate choice was made by uh, President Johnson to hide the cost of, the, of war from the American public okay, by resorting to monetary inflation. Um, all right, in a modern economy such as our own, okay, most of, of laborers involved in production are involved in producing capital goods. Okay? Um, a few years ago, Mark Skousen, in a book, attempted to find the proportion of, of, of investment spending on, on capital goods, okay, machines, um, uh, computers, raw materials, and so on, uh, as a proportion of total spending in the economy. So if you compare the total spending on, on consumers' goods okay, to the total spending on what, what we call in economics the higher stages of production, it turns out that uh, total spending on capital goods is three or four times the total spending on, on consumers' goods. So at any given moment in time, we have the, the value of capital goods in society is much higher than the value of, of, of consumers' goods. Now what does that mean for war financing? Very important. Uh, what it means for war financing, or, or actually for the real costs of war, is that resources must be transferred, okay? Not just from consumers' goods, okay? It's not, not, only, it's, it's not only enough for consumers to tighten their belt, to eat le less beef, to drive less and use less gasoline and so on, okay? In fact, what must happen is that the capital stock in society must deteriorate. Um, Joseph Schumpeter, great economist, said that, that war is a substitution of the present for the future, okay? All production must be for the immediate run, tanks, ships, ammunition, uh, rations for the troops. Okay. Labor must be pulled away from, in, in some manner, the production of, of capital goods, the repair of machinery, okay, the running of mines, and so on. So pretty quickly, what, we'll, what we see happening is that there's a, an increase in, in the production of war goods 
and plus consumer's goods, all right? And you have many fewer capital goods almost immediately being produced in the economy. Uh, now, what that means is that, that the provision for the future pretty much falls apart or, or, or is reduced, okay? The economy takes on a higher time preference, okay? It's much more present-oriented. Um, Now, how do we, Mises, Mises argues in his book on um, uh, war, state, and, and the economy, war, the, or nation state, nation state and economy in 1919, he argues that um, it's, easy, it's simple as a matter of technique to uh, finance a war by increasing taxes. Uh, by, if you increase taxes, we know what's going to happen. Um, consumers will suddenly find, citizens will suddenly find their disposable incomes falling. Okay, they'll have less money to spend on consumers' goods industries. So almost immediately you'll find lower prices of consumers' goods initially um, and lower profits in those industries. Okay. At the same time, the government will have these proceeds and will begin to demand tanks and so on. So the, the, the laborers that are thrown out of work in, in the consumer goods industries will be shifted over to the um, war goods industries. But that's not, that's not all that happens. Consumers also cut back on their savings. Okay, it's a very, very important effect. And that drives up the interest rate in the economy. Now, if we add to this non-inflationary borrowing, which the, the, econ the um, government also may engage in without causing inflation, that means that the government becomes a borrower competing with private borrowers on, 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 on the market for savings, on the market for loans. Okay, so that further drives up the interest rate. So the interest rate skyrockets. This uh, occurred uh, at the beginning of World War I, for example. Now, what does that mean? That means that the value of, of, of capital goods okay, suddenly falls. Business has much less funds available because it's been competed away by government on the one hand. On the other hand, consumers have cut back on, on their private savings. So business has much less funds with which to purchase capital goods for private production. The hot, so, so, so the values of these things fall, uh, and stock market, which is basically a titles to capital goods, begins to collapse. Okay? Uh, at the same time, then, firms cannot pay uh, their, their debts, capital goods firms, those that are going out of business, those that, that are producing goods that are not adaptable to, for war purposes, okay, suffer losses, lay off their employees, and begin to default on their bonds. Um, I wouldn't be an economist without a recourse to the board. Um, in any case, a crisis ensues. So, without inflation, you have the crisis almost immediately. Okay? Not only that, but with monetary calculation, people see almost immediately that their, 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 um, their standards of living have, have fallen. Stockholders find that the price of their stocks have fallen. Businesses find that, that, that the values of, of, of their, their capital has decreased. The values of their firms have decreased tremendously. So wealth and income falls immediately uh, with taxation and, and, and uh, borrowing to reflect the fact that there is capital consumption in the economy, that the economy is living on the future now, that it has shifted a tremendous amount of resources into the production of, of the present war goods. Uh, and as Mises points out, um, People are suddenly hit with this cost, and they don't like it. And in fact, as, as I'll, I'll mention in, in a little while, economists that defend the recourse to inflation as necessary, um, are, when, when pushed, uh, argue that, well, uh, taxes can't be raised to cover the full cost of, of war, especially a major war, because the, the, the people wouldn't stand it. But what does that mean? That means that war's too costly. When, it, when it's not obscured. Okay. Um, so, the state then resorts to uh, inflationary financing. Basically what occurs is that the government begins, or rather the central bank in, in the United States, the Federal Reserve System, will buy up bonds from the public. Okay? It will create new money out of thin air to buy government bonds. Now, it doesn't have to buy directly from the Treasury that, is, that are issuing these bonds in order to borrow. Okay? It's enough that it, it buys the bonds from the public uh, and in turn creates bank reserves. The public take these checks, which are, are, are written out, okay, drawn on the, on the bank itself, the central bank, 
deposits them in, in, into, into the uh, banking system, and you have a multiplication of, of money and credit. So, so the bank, or rather the, the, um, the treasury, gets control over these, this newly created money, okay? Indirectly, but no less effectively. It then can go out in the market and it can begin to, to bid for war goods. Now, the difference between this case and the case of financing through taxation and non-inflationary borrowing is that the interest rate doesn't shoot up. The interest rate is pushed down. Uh, there's what Keynesians like to call a coordination between monetary and fiscal policy, basically creating money out of thin air to finance the government's deficits. Um, so you don't get the crisis right away. Okay? You do get rising prices. But when prices begin to rise and profits begin to, um, to increase, uh, the government can then blame war profiteers. Okay? It's not it's not clear that now that what, what they're doing, okay, that, that's the war policy in and of itself that is creating the, uh, the cut in standard of living through the rise in the cost of living. Uh, so we get an inflationary boom, okay, as a way of financing the war. Now that boom can go on for a number of years. And, and during the Vietnam War, uh, it began in 1965, um, it, it paused. Um, in 1969, 1970, and then it, it came to an end in 1973, okay? Uh, so the, the full effects of, of, of financing this war, which wasn't as expensive, though it is, in, in money terms, it was the second most expensive war in the United States after World War II, okay? It cost, on a full cost basis, and uh, not really counting um, the post-war costs in terms of veterans' benefits, it cost about $140 billion, okay? Um, in, in, in the years of highest spending, 1968-69, the uh, amount spent, which was about $25 billion in those years, on defense for the Vietnam War was seven times the uh, GNP of North Vietnam, okay? Um, just the cost overruns on two Pentagon projects during that war exceeded in uh, one year's GNP for both North and South Vietnam, just, just the cost overruns. Um, so it w w was a fairly expensive war, but in terms of, of, of U.S. GNP, it certainly didn't approach the 45% or whatever of GNP that was being taken uh, for the war effort during World War II. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, now, there's very briefly, let me just mention two, before I get to the Vietnam War in a little bit more detail, the two uh, other theories. Uh, one other approach to war financing was put forward by Lionel Robbins, who was a, a follower of Mises uh, up, until, up until about the mid-30s or so, um, and a few other uh, British economists, A.C. Begu and Ralph Hortree. Basically, what they argued was that inflation was inherent. You could not finance war production completely out of taxes and non-inflationary borrowing. Um, Robbins basically argued that Government demand uh, for the war is, is unlimited, okay? Um, which doesn't make sense. I mean, they're limited by tax revenues, but he claimed that, 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 um, that the, the, the war producers could exact uh, almost infinite prices. Okay? It's a total lapse in, in, in his economic analysis, almost infinite prices from government. Uh, he also argued that um, when, when the government borrowed, uh, interest rates would shoot up, which was true, but they wouldn't go up fast enough, he claimed so that the banking system would accidentally create new money. Okay? And he had a number of other uh, very weak arguments in favor of his view that you always needed inflation and controls. He's in favor of price controls and so on during wartime, whereas Mises sh showed that none of this, none of this is, is necessary. Okay. Um, we then come to the Keynesian view, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that when I'm talking about the Vietnam War. Um, the Keynesian approach really muddles things up. Um, after World War II, we began to get Keynesian economists arguing, uh, one was uh, Albert Hart, that if, if we don't have full employment, if there is what they call an output gap, that we have unemployed resources and the economy is producing below its potential, then in that case, war is free. Okay? The government, it's free. The government creates a 20, let's say we have a, 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 a hundred, uh, let's say a $50 billion output gap. Uh, the government creates $10 billion in war expenditures. It's free because then the people who would pay for that $10 billion turn around and spend more money, and it, 
generates, let's say, 50 billion new dollars of, of spending and therefore output in the economy. Right? So war, war is free if, if there's no, um, in fact, war spending is beneficial if, if we have an output gap or if we're in, we're, we're in a recession. Uh, but if we're at full employment, the Keynesians then argue, um, spending on any type of spending, including war spending, is inherently inflationary. The government has to spend 100 billion new dollars, but yet the, the GNP is being purchased, all potential GNP is being purchased at, at, at non-inflationary prices. So basically what they argue is that um, you have too much spending in the economy, so that they take the focus off of this tr tremendous transfer of resources from capital goods to immediate production, and they focus on total spending. They say, well, it's just a matter of technique, okay? There's too much spending, but we can handle that. Um, we can prevent inflation by raising taxes. Okay, so they, they, they break the link between taxes and spending. Increasing taxes is just one method by which we, we cool off an overheated economy. Okay? Uh, or we can, um, uh, we can restrict the growth of the money supply and drive interest rates up, which will make business spend less, allowing the government to spend more without an inflation. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to that point. It's, it's important to keep this, this, that crazy theory in mind. All right, let's look at the Vietnam War inflation. And my argument is that, in fact, um, it was uh, involved a deliberate decision to inflate the money supply to hide the costs of, of the uh, uh, Vietnam War from the American public. Okay, um, the, uh, we can date the beginning of the war I mean, variously, but from in February 1965, we had air, air attacks on North Vietnam. In April 1965, um, President Johnson made this a secret decision to commit 300,000 troops to South Vietnam. Um, during those months, uh, the Johnson administration, during the following months, the Johnson administration deliberately downplayed uh, the involvement in the war, okay, because it didn't want its great society programs to be held up in Congress. Um, the Johnson administration was fearful that if it, if it, if it, if it um, related the true cost of war to Congress, they would force um, increase in taxes and cutbacks in, in spending on, on domestic programs. Uh, Robert McNamara was, um, was um, right in the middle of this, this whole deception. He uh, told Congress it would only cost, the whole war would cost $10 billion. I remember it wound up costing $140 billion. But by assuming um, that it would end arbitrarily on June 30th, 1967. Um, it, so, he, so he underestimated, um, just in the first calendar year, uh, costs outran um, the original estimates by $14 billion in 1966, and then um, uh, in 1967 it outran uh, by about $9 billion, the original estimate. Um, now let me mention the, the part played by the Keynesian new economists who came in to advise the Kennedy administration and then later um, served under, under Johnson. Um, they, they included James Tobin, Walter Heller, okay, Arthur Oaken, uh, Paul Samuelson, Gardner Ackley, a real rogues gallery uh, of economic ignorance. Um, they advocated, from, from 1961 to 1964, they advocated expansionary monetary and fiscal policy, basically deficit spending and inflation, because they believed there was an output gap, that the, U, that the US economy was running below potential. Okay? They counted as one of their greatest victories uh, in 1962, uh, when we had the buildup in defense in response to the Berlin crisis. They successfully convinced President Kennedy not to ask for higher taxes. Okay, so that was there was there was a small inflation there or an impetus towards inflation there. Okay, and this this was to be important for for later on in financing the uh, Vietnam War. As I mentioned, the budgetary cost of the war uh, on a full cost base was about $140 billion. Um, uh, it reached 3.2% of, of GNP in 1968 and 1969. So spending on the Vietnam War was, was, was absorbing 3.2% of um, our um, gross national product. Um, now, If we look at the federal, uh, the federal government outlays, okay, uh, in 1965, 
um, they, they absorbed about 18% overall federal government outlay, outlays. By 1968, they absorbed about 21%, okay, a 3.4% increase. Much of that was due to the increased spending on the Vietnam War, okay. Yet, there was not an increase in, 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 in tax rates uh, until mid-1968. So, tax receipts did not go up as a percentage of GNP, okay. So, there was an immediate... Uh, there wasn't that immediate feedback to the American public. It went up from 17.7% to about 18%. Okay. Um, so the Vietnam War wasn't, at least in its early years, primarily financed by um, tax, tax increases. Okay, how was it financed? By deficits and what economists call seniorage. Okay, the, the, the seizing of or confiscating of resources through the creation of new money and spending of that new money in the economy. Um, that is, by the Federal Reserve creating uh, uh, checks written on itself and creating reserves with those checks out of thin air by buying up government bonds. Uh, let's look at the, uh, the cumulative federal budget deficits in the nine years prior to um, the Vietnam War. Um, from 1956 to 1964, the accumulated deficits were equal to about $11 billion. Um, the increase in, in, in what we call the monetary base, Okay, the amount of, of, of spending by the Fed on government securities, okay, which is the way by which it creates new money, was about $3.8 billion. Okay. So the Fed did not create much new money for, for the Treasury to spend during those years. Uh, in 19, from 65 to 73, the nine years of the Vietnam War, federal budget deficits, again, accumulated over those years, went from $11.1 billion to $68.9 billion. Okay. So about half of the war was financed by federal budget deficits. And of that, about $40 billion um, was financed by creating new money. Okay, that, that's the amount of the increase, about $40 billion, of the Fed's stock of government securities. Okay, it created this new money to purchase the Treasury um, bonds. Um, now, that $38 billion new dollars or rather, new reserves in the economy. Okay, the bank system now had 38 billion new, new, new dollars of reserves. Was multiplied. Okay, when the banks lent those new reserves out after they were deposited, okay, by by the people who sold the, bond, the, 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 the or who um, uh, sold the bonds to to the Fed, um, that 38 billion dollars was multiplied as it was lent out uh, into a hundred billion dollar increase in M1. So uh, there was $100 billion new dollars created in the economy in those nine years. Um, now, let me give you some figures on the dimensions of the inflation. Um, from 1955 to 1964, the year before the war, uh, the change in the money supply was about $21 billion. Okay? Now, that re represented about 1.75% a little less than 2% increase per year in the money supply, which was fairly moderate. Um, as a result of that, we had um, an increase, or oh, I'm sorry, that, that worked out to be, yeah, uh, an increase in the CPI of about 1.6%. Again, inflation in those nine years was running below 2%, as was the increase in the money supply. So both money inflation and price inflation was, was fairly moderate. In fact, some economists claim that um, that, that 1% to 2% price inflation that we had up until 1964 was actually um, uh, consistent with a stable price level. That is that through statistical errors, you, you couldn't get it any more exact than that. We may very well have had a stable price level. Um, I would be much more happy if it was falling by 1.6% per year. Um, so uh, let, let's now jump to, to the, um, the Vietnam era. Okay, there the um, increase in the money supply was $104 billion, okay, um, which was about a 64% increase in the money supply over those years, and which represented 7% increase per year in the money supply. Uh, as a result, um, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, uh, increased by about 5% per year. So it was, it was the inflationary finance of the war that brought about the inflation of prices okay, that we experienced, um, the much larger inflation of prices that we experienced over the nine years of the war. 
One other point that I might quickly make, um, due to what is called the Bretton Woods system, in which the U.S. Uh, tied its dollar to gold, stood ready to redeem uh, foreign dollars, dollars held by foreign central banks, uh, for, um, for gold at the rate of $35 per ounce of gold. Okay? They, they were willing to, to, to sell gold to foreign banks at that price. Um, we were able to export part of the cost of the war onto foreign countries. Um, as a result of the inflation, the U.S. began to run uh, a perennial balance of payments deficit. Um, the total, let me just give you the total deficits. The total balance of payments deficits um, in the years of the war were a 66, um, approximately $66 billion. Okay, uh, actually $50 billion. Um, now, what that meant was that the U.S. was sending out dollars. Foreign governments were willing to hold these dollars because initially they had confidence that the U.S. would redeem them in gold. In exchange for the dollars, these $50 billion worth of, uh, of paper that the rest of, the, uh, of, of, of the, the industrial countries were getting from us, they sent us real goods and services. So the, the cost of the war was cushioned by the fact that we imported um, real wealth, assets, and goods and services from the rest of the world. So the rest of the world was then financing our war effort, giving us real resources. Okay, to the tune of, of $50 billion over those years uh, in exchange, as I said, for our paper. Um, let me just talk briefly about the uh, legacy um, of the Vietnam War inflation. Uh, first of all, it, uh, President Nixon, uh, as a result of, of the inflation um, and, and, and the effect on our gold stocks, Okay, we had something like um, $28 billion or $23 billion worth of gold in the late 50s. By 1971, we had uh, no more than $9 billion. Gold was flowing out. Some of those paper dollars had, in fact, been redeemed. Um, and at the rate at which gold was leaving the country uh, during August of, of 1971, we would have had lost our gold stock within two weeks. So President Nixon closed the gold window. Now, what that did was to, 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 to um, cause us to lose the opportunity for a very long period of time of ever restoring the gold standard. Okay? In the late 60s, before that had occurred, there were some economists that were arguing that it would have been easy to go back to a full um, international gold standard, uh, RUEF and, and Halperin, uh, by simply raising the price of gold and uh, ensuring that no government ever again accepted dollars in payments for balance of payments deficits. Okay. So those, those plans did not have a big chance. Okay. However, any chance of going back to a gold standard um, was ended uh, with, with Nixon closing the gold window in response to the Vietnam War inflation. Uh, the, Vietnam, the inflation was brought to an end in 1973, um, yet we, we continued to have uh, it had, uh, inflationary expectations. People that didn't expect or didn't believe that the government was, was, was truly going to end inflation. So we continued to get price increases during the recession that we had, which was a very deep recession from 73 to 75, uh, the deepest post-war recession up to that point. Uh, so we were stuck then, one of the other legacies, with uh, um, what we might call stagflation, inflationary recession. Okay. That's another legacy. Um, in the late 60s, or up until the late 60s, uh, Americans were not... Uh, uh, possessed of, of inflationary expectations. Um, uh, we were stuck with wage and price controls in 1971 uh, that went on in various phases through early 1974, um, but were not all removed. Okay? In fact, they were left on oil and, and gas, which led to a restriction of, of production of oil and gas here in the United States and the propping up of the OPEC pet cartel okay? and, and, and the resultant gas crisis. Finally, in four, um, the fourth point and the last point, um, economists have long been puzzled by a drop, a sudden drop in productivity of labor that occurred in 1973. Uh, and that's evinced today by the fact that uh, real wages in 1994 are still less than they were at their height in 1972. They've never recovered. And economists are puzzled by this. Um, there's no standard answer to it. But um, I suggest that, in fact, 
Um, it was a result of the cap tremendous capital consumption that occurred during the Vietnam War, not just due to the war expenditures, um, but, but due to the inflationary distortions okay, that, that caused distortion of monetary um, uh, calculation, uh, and to the wage and price controls that existed from 1971 to 1974 that distorted entrepreneurial decisions to, to invest in capital goods. Okay. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you.